Hi everyone, welcome back to Lifting the Lamp. Well, after my last video giving a demonstration of the middle pillar exercise, I asked you if you wanted me to do a video giving a bit more of the background of the exercise, and you said yes. So that's what I'm doing tonight. I'll be discussing the origins of the middle pillar exercise and some of the symbolism of the various components of the exercise, breaking all of that stuff down and providing a bit more information about the exercise. So first of all, where did the middle pillar exercise come from? Well, if you saw my previous video, which I'll link in the description below, uh, you'll know that uh, the middle pillar exercise was created by a man called Israel Regardi. Israel Regardi was a 20th century occultist. He was a student of Aleister Crowley, and he was very heavily influenced by the Golden Dawn tradition, the magical system of the secret society operating in Europe around that time, slightly earlier in the late 19th, early 20th century, called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Uh, and Israel Regardi was famous in the occult world for publishing all of the Golden Dawn's rituals and initiations and all of the uh, material that they taught their students uh, in the various grades. Uh, and if you can, you can find that book uh, today, um, and if you can come across a copy, it's, it's a very useful resource to have indeed. So by the time Israel Regardi was doing all his sort of stuff, publishing his books, uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, as it was originally formed, had sort of fallen apart. There's modern versions of the Golden Dawn today, uh, but the original version of the order uh, collapsed at the end of the 20th century. Uh, so it was bef before Israel Regardi's time in that respect when he developed the Middle Pillar Exercise. But what influence the Golden Dawn did have on the Middle Pillar Exercise is that Israel Regardi drew on the Golden Dawn system of magic to put together the Middle Pillar Exercise by referring to uh, the Kabbalah, by referring to the different attributions of certain god names to a particular sephira. This sort of style of exercise uh, its very similar to something like a banishing or some of the other exercises that the Golden Dawn would prescribe to its students. So in that sense we can see the Golden Dawn influence on Israel Regardi even though the middle pillar exercise is not a Golden Dawn ritual. So why is this exercise called the middle pillar exercise? What is the middle pillar exactly? Well, this is where we go back to Kabbalah. Um, if you see my previous videos on the Kabbalah, um, some of which I can link in the description below, you'll know that the principal element of that system of Jewish mysticism is the tree of life. The tree of life is a diagram which is a blueprint uh, that so much of the Kabbalah fits into. And it's been used as a sort of filing cabinet of different archetypes and different types of spiritual energy, whether that's astrological, elemental, etc., uh, for ceremonial magicians, such as in the Golden Dawn. And so basically, you have the Tree of Life, you have the Ten Sephiroth, uh, connected by various paths. But then there's different divisions you can make of the Tree of Life. For example, there's three triads that you can divide the tree into, uh, two abysses that appear on the tree. Uh, this is something that um, a lot of people don't realize. There's actually two abysses on the tree rather than one. That's something that I'll talk about another time. And another way that the tree gets divided up is into three pillars. But usually there are the two pillars of the tree that are considered the most essential. So if you're looking at the diagram of the tree of life, on the left hand side, you have one pillar, which is um, the three Sephiroth at the leftmost far side of the tree. And then on the right hand side, on the farthest most right side of the tree, you've got another three Sephiroth. And so you've got uh, one pillar on the left, which consists of Bina, Gabura, and Hod. This is justice or severity. And on the other side, You've got the, the second pillar, which consists of uh, Chokmah, said and Netzach. And this is considered 
the pillar of mercy. And for the Kabbalists, these two pillars were the two pillars uh, of the will of God, uh, justice and mercy. And if you had one but not the other, then the universe um, would not be able to function in an ordered fashion. If you have severity or justice without mercy, then you get tyranny. If you have mercy without justice, you get uh, softness and acquiescence to wickedness. Um, so it's important to have a balance. And the two pillars together are an important symbol that appears again and again in esoteric religion. Uh, if you walk into a Masonic temple, the first thing that you're met by is the two pillars. Um, and this is taken straight from the original blueprint of the temple in Jerusalem, which likewise had its two pillars, Jachin and Boaz, representing the two polarities of uh, the divine order. But then if you look at the tree of life, of course, there are four sephiroth here which haven't been ascribed one or the other pillar. And these are the ones that appear in the middle, the middle shaft of the tree. And this is a third pillar known as the middle pillar. This is a pillar that is neither pure justice nor pure mercy, but it is the pillar of equilibrium. It balances the other two polarities of the tree, of the universe, of, of the governance of the universe. And so when we're talking about a ritual to call down the middle pillar, to, to invoke the energies of the middle, middle pillar, what we're really calling upon is uh, the establishment of a sense of balance and equanimity, um, as well as uh, forming a connection between um, the heavens and the earth. Because the other thing that makes the middle pillar unique is that it includes both the uppermost sephira of Keta, the crown of the tree, and the lowermost, Malkut, representing the physical world. So by invoking the energies of the middle pillar, you're invoking balance, and you're also uh, re-establishing a connection to the divine, and allowing that energy to flow through so that it may cause um, more balance and equilibrium to be established in your life. So what are the Sephiroth that appear on the middle pillar? Well, I've already mentioned two of them. There's Keta, the crown, the very highest manifestation of divinity and purest, um, which is singular and indivisible. And then at the bottom, you've got Malkut, the, phys the physical world that we inhabit. And between those, just above Malkut, you've got Yesod, which is the lunar sphere, which is associated with the unconscious mind, uh, the world of dreams, very close to the physical, still very close to the world of our instincts, our emotions, and so forth, uh, but still not purely physical. Above that, you've got Tifereth, which represents the sun, the conscious mind, will, intent, um, uh, self-awareness, uh, and also balance and harmony. So very similar to the middle pillar as a whole in that respect. Um, it is the solar force that lies at the center of the tree and balances the whole tree. And then in between Tifereth and Keta, at the very top of the tree, there's another, for lack of a better term, Sephira. Uh, which is in fact not a sephira at all. This is the so-called false sephira of dart. So if you're ascending the tree uh, from the lowest sephira to the highest, uh, you need to pass through the abyss to get from the lowest seven spheres to the highest three, the supernal triad, uh, which is pure divinity and situated in the abyss is the, is the false sephira of Dart, uh, which is known as the sephira of knowledge. And the reason why it's considered to be false is because uh, knowledge in the ordinary sense, in the intellectual sense of applying pure logic is not possible beyond the abyss. Uh, all of our concepts break down. And so uh, one way that you can get lost in the abyss is by believing 
that you have comprehended what is above the abyss with knowledge, in which case you believe that you've stumbled across a new realm in the heavens, uh, which is in, in fact illusory um, because it cannot exist. And that is uh, the, the realm of pure objective knowledge of that which is beyond the phenomenal world, uh, which is what DART represents. Um, and it's false because it cannot exist. Uh, but it still gets used in the middle pillar and it still gets used uh, in mysticism uh, as having properties in its own right. Uh, it can be seen as useful because of its properties of representing knowledge, for example. It can be seen as, if not a false sephirot, then at least an imperfect one. Um, one which describes something beyond language using some kind of a language, um, but gives some description pointing to that higher supernal triad nonetheless. And so, so long as we understand the limitations of that knowledge, perhaps there's some utility in the higher knowledge represented by Dart. But anyway, that is the elements of the middle pillar. So in the middle pillar exercise, what happens is uh, that middle pillar on the tree of life is overlaid on the human body. Uh, and indeed, the Adam Kadmon, the representation of the ideal human being, uh, can be superimposed on the tree of life uh, because the human being is the blueprint of the universe and of the divine, uh, the microcosm to the macrocosm and so forth. So the middle pillar can also be superimposed on the middle of the human body running uh, roughly down the spinal column uh, and also to the bottom of the feet. And so when you situate a sephira at each point on the body where it overlaps with the human body, it's similar to the system of chakras that you might be familiar with in Vedic religion, in uh, yoga or Hindu based forms of mysticism. Uh, and it is kind of similar, but it's not the same system. This has Western roots. Um, so when we do superimpose that middle pillar on the human body, what does it look like? Well, Keta is at the crown. Uh, and this is very similar conceptually to the crown chakra in Hinduism. Uh, although there's not exact parallels in both systems, sometimes you can find quite striking parallels. And this is one case of that. Um, so the highest divinity uh, is at the top of the head. Uh, in fact, only slightly touching the human body because really uh, where that energy comes from is somewhere beyond uh, this limited human form that we have. Uh, somewhere higher, you might say. And then dart is situated in the throat. And this is appropriate because uh, the throat, of course, is the, the organ of communication. It's associated with knowledge. Uh, but of course, if knowledge does not fully um, or accurately describe what it's referring to, it can also be a source of deceit. Um, but because of that association with dart, it's appropriate for dart to be at the throat. Tifereth is situated at the heart or around the heart region because, of course, Tifereth, as the sun, is very linked to the heart, which is the seat of our, of our conscience, our individual consciousness, all of which is very associated with Tifereth. And, of course, Tifereth is at the heart of the tree. Travelling down the pillar again, we reach Yasod, which is located at the level of the generative organs. This again is very appropriate, as one of the associations of the sphere of Yasod is with uh, that element of the human experience, uh, the sensual, sexual kind of aspects of the human experience. Uh, the very, you know, linked to instinctive drives being very driven by where emotions take us, feelings take us, all of that sort of a thing. And then finally, uh, Malkut, appropriately enough, is at the feet, at the bottom of the soles of our feet, 
uh, it's the sphere where we're grounded in the material world. So it's only appropriate that that sphere should be invoked at the point at which we physically touch the physical world. And so by performing this ritual, you establish the middle pillar in your physical presence, some would say in your astral body, allowing the energy to come down from Keta and enter your life through the middle pillar and to balance the energies of your life. Now, there are other variations of the original middle pillar exercise as it was conceived by Israel Rigardi. Perhaps the most well-known variation is after having performed the middle pillar exercise, you then engage in an additional step which is known as the circulation of the body of light. This is where you imagine after the invoking of the god names going down from Keta to Malkut, you imagine now energy going up, uh, that shaft in the middle of your energetic body and then coming out of the, the top of your head like a cascading fountain coming down around you and then hitting the ground near your feet and then curving around again, then curving up and coming up through the middle again. And you circulate the light of the astral world in this way several times. And it's said to charge your body of light, so-called. Theosophists and others would say that there's actually several energetic bodies, the etheric, the astral, the mental, the causal, etc. Uh, often they're grouped together as the body of light and by performing the middle pillar followed by the circulation of the body of light, you're calling in more of that divine energy and then using that, uh, distributing it throughout your energetic body to build that energetic body up. Just like you use food, you eat food, your body breaks that down into protein and uses that to build muscle and tissue and so forth. Uh, you're, you're using that energy that you've called in to build the tissue of your body of light, uh, referred to by the Tibetans as the rainbow body. Now, in my opinion, the circulation of the body of light is not the best way to build up the body of light. There's a far more effective method of doing this through Tantra, uh, much more powerful and intense uh, transmutation of energy, which then gets metabolized by the body of light. Um, but that's a topic all on its own. Uh, but the circulation of body of light is fine for building that up. It might just be a lot more of a slow process. So if you believe in astral travel and all of that sort of thing, or or you believe in concepts like the Merkaba, the, the light vehicle that you can build uh, within your energetic body, the circulation of the body of light would be a good exercise for you to practice. So it was many decades ago that Israel Rigardi actually wrote down the middle pillar exercise, uh, but how has it been applied in a modern context? Uh, well, the middle pillar exercise, although underrated for a very long time, in the Western esoteric tradition, in my opinion. Uh, it has been more recently popularized by Damien Eccles, who says that the middle pillar, together with the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram, both of which I've also demonstrated on this channel, uh, he credits those three rituals with uh, helping him to survive death row. That's a pretty huge claim. So for Damien Eccles at least, the middle pillar exercise is of supreme importance. It's got very powerful uh, applications in that respect. And one thing which working with energy so directly and so intensely uh, really does with the middle pillar exercise is it helps you to understand your being beyond the physical world. And why that's important is because uh, it means that you discover a part of you that is eternal, which is untouched by the tyrannical systems of oppression that you find yourself in, which can only oppress matter uh, and are based only in the material world. They know nothing of the higher aspects of human nature. And so 
by accessing those higher aspects and understanding that to be tapped into that is freeing in itself. Uh, in a way, you're able to overcome the, the oppression that wicked systems that are in the world attempt to impose on you. Uh, it's for this reason as well that Karl Germer, uh, who was a member of the German OTO, um, taken to a concentration camp during World War II, was able to have the experience of knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Even in the camps, he was able to have that experience um, because this stuff is beyond matter. And so that can be very liberating to, to learn that you can tap into some part of yourself uh, that operates at that level. And I imagine that for Damien, uh, that was part of the reason why rituals like the middle pillar exercise were so handy for helping him to get through that really harrowing period of his life. Uh, and having sung the praises of the middle pillar exercise tonight, it's probably not a exercise that I do enough. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that explanation. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you've only just discovered my channel and you support what I'm doing here. Uh, like the video as well if you want to give me extra support. If you have any comments, leave them down below as per usual. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you next time.